Unfortunately, the blood of Muslims is very cheap. They really want to build the nuclear capabilities in Iran. There are serious fears of many people that that will constitute a danger on the region and a danger on the world. By joining BRICS, mm. Iran would say, do you really want us to go that path? Or do you want to have an agreement? It is Islam who protected the Christians and the Jews where they all lived in peace for centuries. Dominance of the Islamic rule for the Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is your brother Uthman and welcome to the I3 Pulse. We're joined by our co-host and resident expert, Sheikh Usta. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. And we're also joined by a very esteemed guest, Dr. Amin. So Dr. Amin is a leading scholar, practitioner, and business expert. And he's a professor of international relations and politics at al Aiz Academy. And he's very known for his strategic insights executive experience in political analysis, and he also holds a PhD in management and civil engineering degree. So Dr. Amin, welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are Pleasure you Pleasure to be here. Alhamdulillah, the honor is ours. So I'll kick this off with the first question. This is on everyone's mind. The IDF targeted uh, specific locations in Tehran, and it is said that they killed four Iranian soldiers. So what should people know about this Iran-Israel power play? Are there new shifts that can shake up the region? Like what's happening here? Uh, it's a great question and thank you for uh, asking it. And uh, like you said, that this is a recent event in a series of events. And uh, what's interesting that uh, the IDF actually uh, made the event that's going to be substantial and they are going to teach Iran a lesson and uh, they will going to hit hard and <clears throat> they're going to show the whole world the might of the IDF. Uh, but on the other hand, the United States uh, said, well, don't hit any strategic locations, don't hit nuclear locations, don't hit any oil production locations. So the United States tuned down the rhetoric and the potential action of the IDF, the Zionist State of Israel. And uh, eventually, as we all know, it was a very limited action as declared by both the Zionist state as well as the Iranian uh, official statement, which means that the United States pressure really worked. Mm -hmm. so the question obviously mm -hmm. is, hmm, interesting. So you can exercise pressure when you want, but you continue to watch thousands of children being killed every day, yeah, including today. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? What's the, question? What's the answer for that one? Oh, the answer for that one is uh, it clearly uh, there are agreements and disagreements on how to exercise this war. There is an agreement around... Apparently, the end of Hamas, at the end of the day, they declared it as a terrorist organization. So with that, the United States does not oppose this particular action of the Zionist state of Israel. There is a disagreement about destabilizing the oil market, about potentially expanding the war beyond, especially right now in the election year, mm. 10 days away from the US okay. elections. And the state like Michigan is vital for the Democrats. It is part of this agreement and disagreement. Unfortunately, the blood of Muslims is very cheap. And uh, it's, <laughs> subhanAllah, it is less important than oil. Kill tens of thousands of innocent children, but oh, don't touch the refinery. Yeah. And then we can see that also in Lebanon. Huh? In Lebanon, uh, there's way less casualties than Gaza. In every single case in Lebanon, they will basically make a full, you know, a warning. People will leave the buildings. Nobody will die from these buildings. In Gaza, they will just actually demolish the buildings over people's heads. It seems basically they're trying to actually, you know, depopulate the, the, the area. That's a wonderful observation. I don't want to minimize the amount of death and destruction that happened in Lebanon, including... Uh, where even the ex-CIA uh, director here in the United States, Panetta, considered to be a severe action by the Zionist state when they uh, planted bombs inside the hockey talkies mm -hmm. because that jeopardized another infrastructure, another economic infrastructure. Mm. And it kills, as you know, thousands of people, including innocent children, unfortunately. Mm. But let's go back to the core question. 
the death certainly in Lebanon is not at the same scale. Yeah. But strategically, it is at the same level. However, there is no doubt that the Netanyahu government declared it by words and by action. Their goal was to expel Palestinians from Gaza. Before they said, we wish that the earth would split and the ocean will swallow all these people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So their goal is to uh, expel Palestinian from Gaza. What's and preventing, uh, Dr. Amin, what's preventing basically the expulsion of, of the Palestinians? One thing. You see, remember in 1948, Palestinians were expelled from Jaffa and Haifa and the, almost 60% of Palestine in 1948. Why? because the borders were open. Mm. However, this time, both the Egyptian government, the Jordanian government, they closed the border. So it was again by US pressure on this government that no, we disagree at this point, that's the United States with the displacement of Palestinians out of Gaza. And uh, as everybody knows, the relationship between the Egyptian government and the United States is very close, and these borders were closed. In fact, if they <clears throat> open the border today, they will leave. Uh, who can tolerate this life right now? So, in in mm -hmm. fact, in their mind, on the long run, by destroying the infrastructure in Gaza, the day after the war settles, they are hoping that there will be voluntarily departure out of Gaza because life there is going to be intolerable. Mm -hmm. And if countries open their doors for Gaza and refugees, the chances are hundreds of thousands may leave. And in this case, Netanyahu would have achieved one of their unspoken goals, which is ethnic the evacu ethnic cleansing of Gaza. So why, why is the Americans basically against the moving of, of the Palestinians into Egypt? It's a really great question. And in my opinion, that uh, the reason for that uh, the United States does not want problems in Egypt and in Jordan today. Mm. Uh, the the regimes there are good good relationship, good strategic relationship with the United States. And if you allow this type of problem to move from Gaza to Egypt, it could destabilize Egypt. So, Remember, it's explosive in Egypt. People, you notice people, even the guy who sells, uh, you know, oranges, yeah. started throwing oranges on the trucks going to Gaza. The sympathy is there. And to see these people in the streets of Cairo or in the streets of Egypt anywhere, it's going to be explosive and the United States doesn't want that. They want the stability for the current regime in Egypt mm. because of the good relationship between the Egyptian government and the United States government. I've heard uh, somewhere where they mentioned that if the borders were opened and then the Palestinians in Gaza were to enter Egypt, then this could create an opportunity for Israel to further enter the Sinai, because they might say that there's a, there's a security threat and we have to secure and to enter it further and it, to prevent their expansion, they have to shut down these borders. Is this a correct analysis? What do you think about that? Yeah, so there is no doubt that from a strategic perspective, it's spoken and it seems to be by action that the eventual goal of the current state of Israel is a greater Israel. At this point, it is not in the best interest of the world and the United States to see the state of Israel expanding. Mm. Uh, keep in mind that uh, a new alliance is evolving in the world between the BRICS, for example. By the way, Egypt is also part of the BRICS right now. So while Egypt is still <clears throat> at the best relationship with the United States, uh, they are seeing some movements toward BRICS. Yeah. And the United States doesn't want to create a reason for other countries to start interfering in the Middle East. It's the jewel of the world today. And the Middle East is, uh, as Kissinger said, whoever controls that area controls the world. Yeah. So uh, this is really why we see right now that dynamic where there is an approval for the state of Israel to do something and this approval to do something else. So can you can you expand a little bit further just for, for the audience level? Like, why is there disapproval uh, you know, for a greater Israel? That's a really great question, uh, Sheikh Usta. Let's remember back to what was the purpose of the creation of the state of Israel. Why did the world in 1948 decided 
to implant the state of Israel. The state of Israel was implanted to keep that area in the current situation that you see it in. It was not implanted there because they truly care about the Jewish people or the Arab people. It was to keep that area under control and not to make Israel a sole player, let alone the dominant player in the Middle East. So in part... It's a chess game, basically. It is. It's a pawn within the Western chess game. It is. It is the United States and the Western world to stay really in control. In fact, I would say it's very unfortunate that uh, at this point, Arabs, non-Arabs in the Middle East are being pawns in the hand of the superpowers. Subhanallah. So they're utilizing, the, they're actually using the Jewish people and the pains of the Jewish people and the Arabs to keep the, the, the area in constant conflict. That's very true. The goal is not to create stability there. Otherwise, they've been talking for decades now about the creation of Palestinian state. But in reality, no, the only, I don't know how many vetoes the United States vetoed those resolutions. So uh, you are spot on in that, Sheikh. So I have a question about, Sheikh, you mentioned this, and Dr. Amin, you mentioned this, that Iran and the U.S., there is a coordination. Some say even hidden allies, as was mentioned before. So there's a recent development uh, where Vladimir Putin recently announced that Iran is now a full member of BRICS. So first of all, what is BRICS? You know, people frame this as the end of the U.S. hegemony, right? The beginning of a more greater multipolar world. And now that Iran joined this, what has changed? And does this contradict the concept of Iran, U.S. are hidden allies if they're a full member of this new BRICS? Can I ask something before the, the, the answer is that when we speak about hidden uh, relationships, yeah. the first principle of international relations is that nations are always in constant cooperation and competition at the same mm. time. Yes. So it's not like there's no conspiracy theory. No, actually, countries basically will have open channels. They will uh, see what basically fits them in a specific uh, situation and might cooperate there and see a challenge in a different situation and compete with the other power, whether it's superpower or regional mm. power for the same thing. So, But go ahead, uh, Dr. Amin. Let's see. Yeah, it's a good clarification. <coughs> and, BRICS and Iran, basically. And, just to... you know, the BRICS started between Brazil for the letter B, Russia for the letter R, India for the letter I, China for the letter C, and South America, South so, Africa for the letter S. So it's these five countries that initially said that this international monetary system controlled by SWIFT, that right. the West really control, uh, and controlled by the dollar, need an alternative currency. They talked about a fairer world, a more fair world in terms of finance. And to allow, and this is really always the Chinese statements, that we want to allow fair development, fair investment. And the current system, according to these organizations, is not fair anymore. So for those who don't understand how the current system is not fair, could you explain that further? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, initially, the whole, I mean, for hundreds, thousands of years, since the world start international trade, gold and silvers, uh, where the commodity of exchange, goods versus goods, goods versus currency, gold and silver were the currency of the world. And there have specific ratios. Uh, there was an agreement. So we go on and all the details, Brits, uh, Britain Woods, uh, until uh, Nixon in the 70s mm. said, well, gold is not what we stand for when it comes to international trade. It is we only have the dollar, and the dollar has a self-value. It is the strength of the economy in the United States, and it does not follow, follow any rule if exchange. And it created a new system. And because the United States is the greatest economy in the world, they were able to have the dollar as the currency of exchange, which means the funds of the world, the transactions of the world, it's all done by the U.S. dollar, even until today. The European tried to balance that by the euro. But then the European Union itself got significantly weakened, mm. especially after the departure of the United Kingdom out of that <clears throat> particular 
the group and then leading to the current war between uh, Ukraine and Russia. In fact, before that war between Ukraine and Russia, the European Union was looking at China as a potential transactional partner. In other words, the BRICS was actually gaining traction mm. even inside Europe until that war happened and then China sided with Russia and the European have their historic fears of Russia. So they now have historic feel of China. In fact, Italy withdrew from certain relationships, France at the same, uh, in Europe and in Canada, they followed the United States lead and they start having uh, rules against certain Chinese product, whether it's the phone or other uh, elements. But at the end of the day, the monetary system became based on the dollar. And the world saying, well, the United States can be as rich as it wants because they can print dollars anytime. That's not fair. Mm. We need a fairer system where all countries can be treated the same. We need an alternative currency mm. for the international trade other than the SWIFT system. Mm. So the SWIFT is interbanking system where international transactions take place and that system really benefits. The BRICS, on the other hand, is that alternative system with some financial ability to conduct international trade. But so far, this did not succeed. Iran uh, joining the BRICS, which is the core of your question, mm. it goes back to what Sheikh Osta alluded to. The, rela the international relationship is very dynamic. Yeah. And as much as there has been <clears throat> some, let's call it harmony, between the United States and Iran, whether it is by Iran telling the United States where they're going to hit and what they're going to hit. Actually, President Trump publicly said yes. they called us and they told us, yes. hey, that. And even right now, even right now it's, really, it's really, really ongoing, ongoing, that type of harmony, releasing billion of dollars for Iran. At the time, Iran really needed that money, the release of some American hostages from Iran. So there is a harmony, but there's also suspicion and fear. Yes. And within the United States, they really don't see Iran in the same uh, same way. Some corners of power in the United States want to use an iron fist, hard diplomacy. Others, they want to use soft diplomacy. But are you saying that both basically uh, politicians or political views want to utilize Iran for a specific... No, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, useful. Iran is useful for the United States in certain circumstances. Uh, absolutely. And it helped, uh, you know, a lot in many cases, as we see today. In fact, uh, the United States found itself trying to pressure and convince Netanyahu not to expand the war where Iran is actually playing ball and they're really playing along. Mm -hmm. And the, Iran is trying their best not to get into a conflict with the United States. Uh, whereas, you know, when you go and assassinate people in other countries, land, I mean, hitting the U.S., the Iranian embassies in Syria, killing some of the guests inside Tehran, uh, somebody assassinating the plane, uh, the, the president of Iran. So there are so mysterious events mm, taking yes. place in so Iran, right. being pressured by Israel to drag Iran into a regional conflict. But the United States doesn't want that because it's not in the best interest of the United States today. In Iran, they really don't trust. There are those, uh, there are sincere forces in Iran that they really want to build the nuclear capability for the benefits of the Iranian people. But there are serious fears of many people that that will constitute a danger on the region and a danger on the world. And the one who leads that is Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. He's been mm -hmm. trying to mobilize the world right. against Iran. Mm -hmm. yes. At the time, the United States is trying to compromise. And there is the internal debate whether it is possible to allow Iran to have a nuclear capability 
capabilities for peaceful solution, for peaceful purposes, uh, whereas there is, and also within that, the American state, uh, a view that, no, you cannot do that. And that's where the dynamics is really taking place. By joining a BRICS, mm. Iran would say, hey, do you really want us to go that path? Or do you want to have an agreement with us and allow us to use a new clear capabilities for peaceful purposes. So, so there's two questions that come here. I mean, the, the first one is, is Iran, just like the Pakistanis, utilize, you know, such alliances like between Pakistan and, and the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War and Pakistan with China as just negotiation chip with the United States and both Russia and China, they know Pakistan is not very serious. Is Iran also doing the same thing where they're not really serious in joining BRICS, but they're just using it as a negotiation chip or would they actually, do they have, the question, do they have the political will to join BRICS if push comes to shove from a political perspective? I want to make two points around this, another great question by you. And both of you, you were not kidding when you told me we have some serious questions <laughs> for you. So thank you for that. Uh, the you know you think about it a nuclear Iran and a nuclear Pakistan who do they th- at what borders who they threaten the most do they threaten the most the United States or Russia and mm. China mm. these nukes are not at the borders of the United States and if they were to be used, whether in a conflict in between Pakistan and India, China is the one that's going to be impacted, or potentially a conflict between Pakistan and even China. Uh, we know that there were Chinese elements that were assassinated in Pakistan. There are conflict in that area. So what I wanted to say is strategically thinking it does not appear mm. that a nuclear Iran mm. or a nuclear Pakistan mm. are threats to the United States. Mm. Now, let's go to the other question about, okay, is it really Iran serious? Iran prefers not to have a conflict with the United States. It is their policy since 1979 Mm. when the regime Mm. was established. And for good reasons. Who wants really to pick a fight with the United States? (laughs) Even China doesn't want it. Exactly. (laughs) Not everybody wants to. It's like, why would you go that route? (laughs) Who wants to go and pick a fight with the bully of the world? (laughs) That doesn't happen. So, however... Uh, Iran would try to convince those elements within the United States that we are better off, don't push us to Russia, and let's make a deal. Trump being the art of the deal type of guy, Mm. uh, he's the one that, uh, you know, kind of went back on the Obama deal. Mm, And until today, between the think tank in the United States and deep strategists, they are arguing whether it was a bad move by Trump or a good move by Trump. Uh, History will tell, even though events are saying uh, that there is that situation. If you leave Iran without a deal, they may develop a nuclear weapon. Mm. But then the United States is not really too much worried. Yeah. The ones who are worried are always the Europeans, actually. The Europeans are worried, and of course, Russian, Israel yeah. is, is worried because they want oh, to be the superpower of the area. And the regional they powers, want yeah. to be the police of the area, and even they were saying it publicly, we yeah. can reach anywhere we want in the Middle East, yeah, yeah. almost in a threatening yeah. uh, town. Yes. I want to ask another question about Saudi Arabia. Do you have any questions about... I was going to ask something, but go ahead. Yeah, so, 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 like, so Saudi Arabia just basically pulled out of the bricks. Why? Well, they didn't pull out. They didn't enter to pull out. You know, technically speaking, they were invited and they said, no, thank you, but thank you. Whereas, on the other hand, United Arab Emirates is there. So, and we know the type of dynamics between United Arab uh, Arab Emirates and the Saudis. The Saudis are, they are known to try and stay loyal to the United States. Since the time of Roosevelt, right? uh, Yes. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, before they were obviously in a close alignment with the British, British, yeah. but then when the United States became the dominant force in the Middle East, um, they were able to uh, get uh, the kingdom. The kingdom does not want, if Iran does not want a conflict with the United States, 
uh, then Saudi Arabia is even more mm. that they really don't want any conflict right now. And they felt that it is not in their best interest. If Iran has a strategic goal, what would be in it for Saudi Arabia to join at this point? Mm. They would rather wait until the dust settles and yeah. then they can make a decision. Sides, yes. But at this point, it's really not in the best interest. So I will add one more thing. The king and the Mohammed bin Salman, they're trying their best to say they are acting in the best interest of the Saudi people and they make decisions based on the best interest of the Saudi people. And even a layman in Saudi Arabia would say, so why are we joining Russia and China and why can't we stick with our allies who are protecting us all these centuries mm -hmm. and the, all of that oil relationship etc et so at this point it appears that it is not in their best interest thus there is nothing in it for them and they felt that if they joined it will be more of a loss than a win and that's kind of in the balance of power in my opinion okay now mm -hmm. some may say it was Blinken was there and he convinced them not to. I don't want to go there. Because yeah. they met at the exact same time, right? It was, the summit, <laughs> it was. It was. They, they gave him summit. a gift. The Saudis are known for very, uh, very lavish gifts. So they gave Blinken probably a gift. There was a recent, uh, I think two weeks ago, there was a document leak before Israel's strike on Iran, which it seemed to delay their strike on Iran, where certain things were intelligence and their response capability was leaked. Why did that happen and who did it? Uh, the United States was very serious. Uh, it, it's not just leaked, now it's almost public knowledge that uh, the conversation between President Biden and uh, Netanyahu was uh, very stern and they draw the line that if you hit this, we are not going to supply you with weapons. Mm. It was a red line that the United States was not willing to cross. Mm. And it is not really about maybe a limited hit on the oil market as much as the highest issue right now in the United States is the elections. The election. mm. And there is a serious possibility. In fact, last week, most polls and most analysts were saying that Trump is ahead of Kamala. And the last thing, the majority of people who held positions, including Dick Cheney, for goodness sake, mm -hmm. uh, is supporting Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. So Republicans that you would categorize as civil servant in the United States government, or call them deep state, if you will, uh, these forces, they really don't want uh, Trump. A destabilization of the oil market right now could mean the end of uh, the Democrats' presidency. That's why they were very serious, in my opinion. Mm. It was not the market. They can sacrifice the market for a couple of days. Mm. Yeah, you see even that, um, that letter that they sent saying that you have to sort all this stuff out, get yourself your act in order. Otherwise, we're going to take some action in the next 30 days. But 30 days ends up being after the elections anyways. See, with all fairness, the United States has been asking the Israeli government for the day after since day one. Uh. They said, OK, what's your plan for the day after? We support you defending yourself. Uh. The United States said, we support you in eliminating Hamas. <clears throat> but then what? And they've been asking the Israeli government, uh, the Zionist state of Israel, they've been asking them to provide a political plan. And of course, there is no political plan because the political plan of Netanyahu has failed, mm. which is the expulsion of the people in Gaza. I would say the deep faith of the people, let alone closing the borders, resulted in a significant failure for the political objective. At the end of the day, killing the leaders of Hamas or Hezbollah, it's not the first time. They killed the previous leader of Hezbollah. They killed the previous leader of Hamas. Plenty of them. That doesn't end the movement like Hezbollah or Hamas. They occupied Beirut. They expelled the PLO. That event, it's a crazy for any observer mm -hmm. to say what Israel is being doing today, aside from being ethnic cleansing, 
and killing innocent people. It has no aim other than killing, it seems, because they really don't have any political solution that they could tell the world. That's why the French, the French president saying, you guys are out of control now. <laughs> Remember who established the state of Israel? Yeah. And then they told yeah. him, no, you learned that we established it in spite of the whole world. And so there is that uh, dynamics that taking place right now. Basically, Israel is a foreign body in the Middle East and it cannot survive. And if they just go back to live in peace with their Arab neighbors like they did throughout history, it was Muslims who protected the Jewish people from the Crusaders, mm. from the European savage that happened in Andalus, in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition, it was Muslims. So is that how you repay, how you pay back those who protect you? And a protecting not because it's a financial interest. Mm. It is a religious obligation on Muslims to protect non-Muslims living among Muslims. Whereas it is what is in the best interest of the, the whole world is selling them. And they can't see that because of that political force called the Zionist regime that's just blinded by hate and not being able to learn from history. Question for you both. What's the end game? The pressure is mounting on Israel. America is putting that pressure for them not to respond. It was a very weak response on Iran. They sent that letter, France's embargo, all these other countries are speaking out against Israel. It's like the world is waking up more and more. How much longer can this go on? How much longer can Israel continue to do this? That's, more, that's one question. Right. So it depends what's going to happen in the coming 10 days. Mm. The uh, Biden administration, uh, see, after the election, nobody is Russian. Mm. It becomes how long can Israel sustain the economic problems and the social problems and the displacement of the people of the north. Mm. At one point, it is going to be the internal uh, public opinion that's going to say to Netanyahu, enough is enough. Mm. Uh, there is no, it's not in the United States interest to go to war. Or it's not in the interest of France. So that would be, the, it can continue until the inter, until Israel cannot continue anymore. Mm. Now, is it going to the, get the point where the area I was listening to Aman Poor on CNN this morning and was talking about how explosive and that boy she is a Jewish Iranian person uh, how, about how the area is now exploding. These people measure the sentiment of the area, and another piece is an ex unexpected explosion or unexpected event that takes place in the Middle East because really people are at the boil of boiling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are the dynamics that could change. It, either an event inside the Zionist state of Israel realizing that their economy is bad, their financial rating dropped down, the people in the north are leaving. Mm. They want, it's almost instead of uh, <laughs> the expulsion of people in Gaza, it is the Israelis who are departing. Mm. So it's working totally against the plan of Netanyahu. Financially, like you said, politically, in the global world, they having now a counterattack in the campuses in the United States yes. and in other places of the world to try and convince the young people. But how could you convince the young people? Actually, even Netanyahu said, how could we face two billion people in Tuk Tok attacking Israel, meaning the Muslim people. And that's very true. Uh, so it doesn't seem, and if one wants to take the recent statement, uh, not as political deception, statements from the state of Israel, statements from Blinken, statements from Harris, saying Israel has achieved its goals, and it's time to stop the war, return the hostages, and find a initiation of political solution. Sheikh, um, Dr. Me mentioned something very profound about mm. the pressure increasing, almost like a pressure cooker. Yeah. And there needs to be some steam that needs to be let out. 
There were some reports about there's going to be a potential two week ceasefire with Lebanon between mm. Israel and Lebanon. Mm. Uh, is this the start to the end of things, or is this just a pause for the elections and then things get back to normal? Yeah, it could be. To be honest, it could be either or. But uh, you know, from from at least the, the military action is a military action limited because the Americans pressured the Israelis not to escalate, or is it just basically as you said, it's going to be stopping? To be honest, uh, like the Israelis couldn't. Uh, move into Lebanon in any, in any like, real shape, really. They just they destroyed certain towns, they flattened them out really fully. They can't they can't invade Lebanon the way they're doing right now. They, nothing succeeded. Mm. They tested many things. Nothing succeeded. The, the only success is basically destroying infrastructure through the air because they have air supremacy, really. Mm. Uh, but the strategy of Iran and Hezbollah is is, is is the same: a war of attrition, and that's what uh, Dr. Amin is saying. Netanyahu. Uh, doesn't have much choices really. He he tried multiple times to escalate for a bigger war that he basically mm. pulled the United States. <laughs> Everybody was saying no. The United States says no. Iran said no. Hezbollah said no. Everybody's saying no, <laughs> and that's why he just all what he, can, he does is just kills kill Palestinian lives. That's, that's the only place he really can do it without any uh, escalation, right? So we'll see what happens after the elections. But uh, I, I believe basically things will come to an end, as I said last mm. time, that uh, Netanyahu is really in his path for failures. He might maneuver, he might be smart and make a couple more maneuvers, sure. Yeah. But I think everybody's in sync that we're going to wait, wait it out until basically Netanyahu falls internally, as, as Dr. Amin said. So there's nothing else that I can see really from that. Is there oh, enough yeah. time to, like, is if this happens, is that going to be something that Netanyahu says, mission accomplished, job done, and and can keep that control over his political power? Or is this just the beginning of the end for him? Good terminology, beginning, beginning of the end for him. Don't forget that he is under investigation internally inside the state of Israel. Mm. He's a criminal, basically, for uh, in the international court. So he has a lot of problems. In fact, there are voices inside the Zionist state asking for an investigation of how Hamas was able to accomplish what they accomplished mm. and what was the role of the Israeli state and why nobody responded for more than six hours mm. before the first soldier could go and save the situation. Uh, those uh, fighters from Gaza stayed inside those kibbutz, those uh, areas inside the occupied Palestine. They were there and uh, they stayed. So he could have stopped the war a long time ago. Mm. It is not in his best interest. I am not as optimistic. Under his sleeves, he proved to have a lot of Creativity. cards yeah, yeah, yeah. that he could play. Yes. And um, obviously, the pressure is mounting on him. Is it possible to give him some sort of a deal that, and a guarantee that he will not be charged legally or he will be saved. But at his neck, personal neck, mm. is on the table because of all the legal and ethical and international problem that he created for himself and for his, uh, uh, for his entity. However, uh, in politics, everything is possible. And uh, there is potentially a solution that they could come up with where they guarantee his personal safety. Remember, that drone that hit his house, Yes, it is a direct threat that we can get you. Play, play game, be a careful. Threat by who? A threat by the United States? <laughs> it, is, it is tough to say. I mean, to what degree uh, uh, the Hezbollah, whoever launched this particular drone, mm. received support from the outside world. I mean, France is not happy. The UK is not happy. The United States is not happy. Iran is not happy. Mm. And all these entities have capabilities. Question is why they did not use these capabilities. Yeah. Mm. And the answer is because as long as it is controlled, it's fine. It's now reaching a point, like you said, the pressure is mounting and there need to be some sort of solution. Uh, I have another I have another perspective on this actually. Yeah. It's the problem is not with Netanyahu alone. That's true. The problem is actually with the whole government and the whole thinking of the alt right in Israel, which I is why I believe. Sorry, no, keep going. Which is why I believe basically the United States is not going to give them a slack because they want this to be a lesson that basically you can't go against the United States and even the international community's interests like that 
and escape pr- prosecution. They, they wanted even, a full change of government. That's why they, they speak about Smotrich and, and Gevir, Ben Gevir and so forth. So uh, it's not just Netanyahu alone. Then. No, I would agree wholeheartedly. Netanyahu is the symbol that represents not only the ultra-right. Uh, it is the entire population of that state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... Uh, I didn't want to say that. I, was like, you know? I, I mean, the majority. Of that, the majority, sadly, is the majority. With the exception yeah. of the thinking people. Like, yeah, for yeah. example, from day one, Thomas Friedman, who is very known uh, writer, and he he is a Jewish a person. He is a Zionist. He cares about the state of Israel. He was totally against what's taking place here now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are very faint voices outside of the state of Israel, and very few voices. So I just wanted to say, yeah. it's not only the ultra light. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is a mindset within the Zionist population mm-hmm. that. Uh, they needed revenge. Mm. Is the international community happy and will allow that to happen and allow it to be challenged? Reality is Gaza and the Palestinians is like not a big deal for them. Mm. I mean, think about it. I mean, in fact, they are so happy as long as it does not hit their interest. Mm. And so far, it's not really, because, just because we are pressured and we feel bad, they don't. It's just because we want to see an end for this, they really don't care. Yeah. And that's what's been proven. It's not like we are analyzing here. Now it's over 40,000 innocent civilians. Today, there was like an 80 people. And it's every day, every day, children cutting into pieces like even the americans right now feeling sad for yeah, these people yeah, so the world, yeah. uh, unfortunately oh. the political establishment in the united states france the uk they don't seem to care about human life mm. people mention one state two state if things draw to an end and a close what is more likely given what's been happening a one state solution or a two-state solution? So we have three scenarios. A scenario that's happening today that I don't think anybody in the world believe this scenario Mm. is the right scenario. So there's that scenario that's taking place today. I think the whole world, any sane person, any ethical person would say what's happening is wrong. Mm. There is the second scenario, that so-called two-state solution that been going on For decades right now, it led to nothing. So nobody is serious about it. The one state solution is a byproduct of the two state solution. So it's just another political maneuver. And then we have another model, the model where they all lived in peace for centuries under the dominance of the Islamic rule for that area. It's an area of majority of Muslims for the whole world, for that particular whole Middle East. And it is Islam who protected the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims and the non-Muslims in that part. Because in the creed itself, that whoever kill one soul, as if they call the whole humanity, that this is a message of mercy for all humanity. And we have it. We have it as a model. It really Mm. happened. We're not talking here about, we see what happened under the rule of Zionism, and we saw what happened under the rule of the Crusaders, and we have the model of the rule of Muslims. And this is the solution. The solution is fairness for all, all live in peace of harmony under an ideology that says you cannot hurt the other that are minorities living among you. And if you do this as if you hurt the prophet of Islam himself. So uh, the solution is obvious, but unfortunately, Muslims are so weak, so divided, uh, and not in a situation to propose the Islamic agenda. Not even Iran, not even Hamas, even these groups, they want to live and continue to live according to the misery that's happening uh, since the uh, collapse of the Ottoman uh, state. Jazakum Allah Khairan, uh, Dr. Amin and Sheikh Usta. Mm-hmm. Um, very insightful discussion and conversation. It reminds me of that statement by Dr. Karen Armstrong, the academic, who mentioned that the only time in history where Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived peacefully in coexistence together in Jerusalem was under Islamic just rule. So we, this is something we wish for and we call for. Like the video, leave some comments, subscribe, and... Do let us know what would you like us to talk about in the next episode. We'll see you next time on the i3 Pulse Show.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق>